Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to those attending and also who are watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hilliard in London. Uh, my name is Councillor Roy Chamdell, and I'm the Chairman of the Licensing Committee. Details of the business to be considered today are shown on the agenda copies of which are available in the room. The agenda is also accessible online under live broadcast. For those present in the room and intend to speak, please note you will be filmed and you can only be heard if you toggle on and toggle off on our little speakers here. A bit of housekeeping fire alarm. Not expecting any fire alarms. If it goes off, it's the real thing. Follow the officers. Uh, mobile and tablet devices. Normal thing. Please switch them off unless you need them. Put them on silent, uh, especially our councillor colleagues. Resident feedback forms, if you're so minded. And it'd be helpful if you could complete one of the yellow resident feedback forms. Well, we've got nobody here, have we? So, uh, But if you want to, you can go ahead. Uh, right, that's all the thing of it. Before we start... Uh, Rather than introduce everybody, I would like everybody to introduce themselves and tell me why you're there. We'll start from my right, moving along. Fire away. Uh, good morning, I'm Councillor Davies. Good morning, Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Sherry Ahmed Valana. Morning, Councillor Rita Chumdell. Councillor Smallwood. Lois King, a licensing officer. Daniel Ferrer, licensing team manager. Uh, PC Dave Butler, police licensing officer for Hillingdon. Good morning, PC Penny Brown. I'm also a licensing officer for the police at Hillingdon. Um, PC James Bradshaw, also licensing officer for Hillingdon. Councillor Nelson West. Councillor Lakmana. Councillor Gardner. Councillor Farley. Good morning, I'm Chantal McLeod, Legal Services Legal Officer today. <coughs> Mark Braddock from Democratic Services. Thank you, everybody. Right, moving to agenda. Any apologies for absence? We have a full house, Chairman. Lovely. Any declarations of interest or matters coming before the meeting? No, no interest at all? Lovely. Uh, you have the minutes of the meeting? Great. Great, thank you. Everything is in part one, so we need to worry about that. All right, we hastily move on to the Metropolitan Police. We have three. So who wants to go first? Fire away. Good morning. Um, yeah, we're just here today to let you know a little bit about ourselves and what it is we do um, on uh, Hillingdon. Um, so as you may or may not be aware, Hillingdon is part of the West Area Policing. So we cover Hillingdon, Ealing and Hounslow. Um, you have um, Dave here who's been with Hillingdon for many years now. Um, myself, uh, I'm a police officer for 19 years, but I've only been on Hillingdon for the last couple of years. And uh, my colleague here, James Bradshaw, he's new to the world of uh, <coughs> licensing. He's going to be mostly heading up Ealing. Um, however, we do all work together and we do get pulled across to help each other out Ealing, Hounslow and Hillingdon. As I say, we are sort of dedicated to yourselves to help as best we can. Um, yeah, we deal with um, all sorts of things on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, we work very closely with the council licensing team. We get sent through applications for new premises licenses, variations to licenses, variations to the people within the licenses, um, and that's something we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the important things for us is dealing with the prevention of crime and disorder. Um, so we will do checks every single day to see if any licensed premises have had any crime and disorder and that's something that we, we follow up on and obviously where necessary take actions, interventions, whether that's meetings, whether that's advice or whether you know further down the line as, uh, as things progress that, that could be some sort of enforcement with regards to reviews. Um, we have around a thousand licensed premises I believe on, on Hillingdon so obviously that's, that's a lot of places that we have to deal with um, so communication is, is key in dealing with these places um, and, and getting the applications right from the start as well when new applications come in uh, and when management changes there to sort of like be working <coughs> with these people to try and help as best we can and make sure that they're being run responsibly. Uh, we, <coughs> we do a lot of multi-agency work, again, working with uh, our partners. Uh, we work very closely uh, with uh, our local authority partners. Um, we've got a couple of projects on the go at the moment. Um, we've got Ask for Angela, uh, which is a nationwide scheme. Um, I'll try and break it down. Uh, if you go to 
not necessarily licensed premises, but it's predominantly licensed premises. So if you go to a licensed premises, hypothetically uh, a date uh, at a venue here in Uxbridge Town Centre uh, that, uh, for one reason or another, isn't going particularly well, the idea is you can approach a member of staff or walk up to the bar area uh, and just say, is Angela working here? It doesn't necessarily have to be word perfect. You don't have to say, um, can I ask for Angela? But you can. Um, but you can just say, does Angela work here? Um, and we hope uh, almost immediately that that member of staff, who more than likely has been trained by us uh, in the last three years, uh, will recognise that as a code word. So what they will do then, the member of staff, what they should do is they should take that individual to a place of safety, i.e. away from the public area, so behind the bar, to a safe room, to the manager's office and then ask them what the, the situation is, what the issue is. Um, and a scenario we had, I say a scenario, it was actually uh, a real event uh, in the premises here in Uxbridge just before Christmas. Um, they were taken to the manager's office, asked what the issue was. It was a bad date. It wasn't going particularly well, um, quite oppressive. And they said, you want us to call the police? Do you want us to call you a minicab? We can escort you home. Um, and that venue um, passed with flying colours. Now, we also have done test purchasing for us for Angela, so we've got brand new recruits from the Metropolitan Police, um, and they've gone in, as they would normally go on an evening on a date, uh, they've gone into a venue. Um, I think we've done 22 venues so far in London Borough of Hillingdon gone, approached the bar staff or a member of staff and said, does Angela work here? 94% uh, of premises passed with regard to um, uh, safety and the correct measures on how to deal with uh, a situation for us for Angela and safeguarding. Um, some failed. Uh, some, for example, uh, replied by saying, Angela doesn't work here anymore. Um, and when we did our post investigation as to why this happened, uh, one venue did have an Angela who worked there four years previously. The other didn't, but it was a default sort of answer to to um, to what was potentially a serious situation. So it's not all about prosecution. <clears throat> We're here to educate. We're, uh, we have the five E's: so early intervention, education. Uh, evidence gathering, um, enforcement where necessary, uh, and then post-evaluation. So those who failed, we offer training. So our next training session for the London Borough of Hillingdon will be at Brunel University, and that's uh, occurring um, in May, 17th of May. So we kindly work with our partners there at uh, the university, and we're, we're allowed to use their lecture theatre. And it's open to everyone. It's open to staff members from licensed premises, to councillors, anyone who would like to attend. Um, again, we work with our partners. Uh, it's, it's an invitation that will be going out. Um, uh, all are welcome. Uh, we'll be delivering the training. We also do a lot of um, work around. People don't realise uh, how vast our area is. Obviously, the second largest borough in London. And the footprint that we have is vast. Uh, a lot of people think that Heathrow Airport cover their own licensing premises. They don't. It falls within the London Borough of Hillingdon um, and firmly in our laps uh, should the need arise to, to enforce uh, or educate or, or do um, compliance visits. So we've got a vast area. We've got all the hotels and the Bath Road and within the Heathrow footprint. Of course, uh, landside, there's no licensing law. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, air side, there's no licensing law, land side there is, so we, again we're responsible for all the licensed premises land side. But we do a lot of CSE work, so child exploitation. Um, we have visited a uh, majority of the hotels uh, within the Heathrow footprint, and we speak to staff members. It's not necessarily um, licensing per se, but our training also involves vulnerability as part of Ask for Angela. So we'll, we'll try and educate. We ask the staff members, for example, um, do you see any lone males or females with young children who are trying to book rooms? Or do you notice 
adults booking rooms and then disappearing and coming back 20 minutes later with with uh, people who appear to be underage. Um, there's a lot of that. Unfortunately, some of the hotels have in excess of seven, eight hundred rooms. So we, we do spend a lot of time trying to deal with child exploitation, uh, which is a big part of our work, not necessarily for licensing, but for policing. And we work with Jackie Roberts here at the council as well. Um, so we've got a vast uh, portfolio, uh, a vast area. And as Penny said, we do cover, unfortunately, uh, where we were pre-BCU merger, uh, the three boroughs, um, we were Hillingdon and we could concentrate on Hillingdon uh, specifically, but now we do actually cover uh, Hounslow and Ealing. And again, uh, Ealing, for example, have over 2,000 licensed premises, Hillingdon have 1,500, uh, uh, Hounslow have 1,500. So. There's a lot of work uh, with minimal staff, unfortunately, but we are getting there. James Bradshaw has um, been recruited um, and is a great asset to the team. Um, so really, that's it from us. If there's any questions or anything you'd like to ask us, we, we'd happily try and answer. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to work in reverse order today. I'm going to let the members ask questions first. So from who I saw put their hand up... Councillor Smallwood, followed by Councillor Chandow, followed by Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered uh, if you could expand a little bit and ask Angela um, around if you're doing anything with Ask Clive as well. Uh, yes, I mean, we, we were looking and we speak with our central uh, licensing uh, department. Um, there's been a number of, I wouldn't say necessarily complaints, but some people um, were trying to explain that Ask for Angela may not necessarily be uh, gender neutral. So we were looking at an alternative. Um, it would be rather complicated with regard to changing the Ask for Angela uh, uh, name and the whole ethos behind Ask for Angela. Um, but uh, I'll be honest with you, Councillor, at this moment we are looking at it, but we haven't started anything with Ask for Clive um, because of the number of incidents uh, that have occurred with regard to us for Angela. Um, we have uh, unfortunately been concentrating on that so far. Any follow up? What I would say though, sorry, just in addition to that, is it doesn't have to be a female that asks for Angela. It can be anyone yeah. of any sex that, that asks for Angela. So whether they're saying they're asking for Clive or asking for Angela, in essence they're the same thing. And the training package is called Ask for Angela and that's that's what the focus is on. However, we do raise awareness that if people do say Clive, it's it's, it's the same, same thing. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I don't believe... I mean, Ask for Clive is obviously uh, directed mainly at the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I don't believe we have any specific venues in the borough, whilst we have some, friend, some, some friendly ones, um, we don't have any specific that cater to... Um, at that audience, um, but I think if we do, we, we should, they should be looked at more seriously, um, for, both from a, from a borough perspective and a policing perspective. If we were to open a prominent LGBT plus there, that is something that that community is recognising as a way to ask. Um, in fairness, I mean, we're here talking about Hillingdon, um, but we do work with the, the only uh, venue of note uh, within the three boroughs that we cover is uh, a club called West Five in Ealing in Pope's Lane. And we've already worked with them with regard to uh, Ask Clive. But I didn't specifically want to talk about that because it isn't a, a Hillingdon Borough thing. But we, we're already dealing with and educating um, uh, with uh, that community in Ealing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, you've answered one question already for me, PC Butler. I was at Council, can we attend the training? Um, so, yes, that would be really appreciated. Um, the second question I have is... Um, how do you do your testing and how do you get your volunteers? Is it police officers or just general public? So we, um, as the Metropolitan Police Service, uh, we have numerous uh, training sites throughout London. It's not just uh, the, the Hendon College or Hendon Police School anymore, training college. Um, it's a number of sites, north, south, east and west. And, and Brunel University are training recruits at this moment, have a recruitment uh, drive and facility at Brunel. So what we do, um, the recruitment sergeant and training sergeant at Brunel is a former licensing officer, a licensing sergeant for this borough, uh, Sergeant Rob Geraghty. And what we do, we tie in with him. We ask for new recruits 
um, probably within their third week, fourth week of training. We ask them, we we have a, a briefing pre-operation, uh, explain what we want from them. We give them a time limit, so we give them 10-15 minutes maximum. Um, obviously, if there's a situation that arises where uh, it becomes a bit um, awkward, let's say, uh, then obviously they're they're then trained or asked to show out as police officers so that they can they can prevent any further escalation. Um, test purchasing also we do alcohol test purchasing and off licenses and we use police cadets. So we've got what used to be a Hillingdon resource is now a tri borough resource police cadets. And we try and do four a year. And we use police cadets for test purchasing for alcohol. Um, uh, predominantly alcohol, we do cigarettes and vapes as well, um, but predominantly alcohol. Um, and we do that four times a year. And um, we do very well out of that. Yeah. No further questions. Councillor Gardner. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, on the Ask Round, I've known about that for some considerable time because of my TV work. Um, have you been to a lot of the community groups? In, I'm talking about predominantly in Hayes to explain about the system because we have lots of uh, licensed premises which are news agents and things like that. And also, uh, some of the women I speak to get stalked. And I think if they knew that there was somewhere that they could go, is, is that something you're thinking about or would you consider it? Yes, most certainly, Councillor. Um, uh, we'd be happy to do that. And I'd ha happily tie in with yourself uh, as a point of contact if you would like that. And most certainly we'd, we would do that. Absolutely. Councillor Berry. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions, as always. Um, are the police still completing walkthroughs of licensed premises? If so, what sort of feedback have you had from that? So, on a Friday night, do you do walkthroughs, etc.? Yeah, I mean, it very much depends on um, what our demands are at the time. Um, as I say, a lot of the a lot of the time we will visit premises and engage with them following an incident, um, and obviously, you know, following up inquiries and. CCTV, just having meetings with them to discuss any changes they might make, any recommendations, what's happening with the security, things like that. But yes, we do do evening work as well, and um, whether it be a Friday night, Saturday night, or, or midweek, um, it, it literally just depends on, on the demands of that week, and we will change our, our shifts sort of accordingly. Um, in particular, we will focus doing sort of later shifts and doing that sort of thing um, when there's larger scale events on. So it could be, for example, like when the World Cup policing's on. You know, we make sure we've got a, a list of all the England games and the times of those, and we make sure there's licensing cover going out and about and visiting the premises. We do a lot of work prior to that, engaging with them to see who's, uh, who's putting on big screens, who's got any big events, and, you know, it's, again, it's all in that, that preparation beforehand. But, yes, we will absolutely go around sort of in the evenings as well. Is that met well by the public at is, uh, do you get good feedback from the publicans or do you find that it's a bit taken out of their time sort of thing when you guys come in? I'd say it varies um, but I would also say that we're quite respectful of the fact that if we go around in the evening and it's a, it's a busy shift we don't want to be taking up their time it's, it's more a case of uh, at that sort of time of the day um, as I say when it is busy it's more of a just a, as a nod to them really just to say hi is everything okay any issues tonight um, we can see you're busy, we'll, we'll leave you to it, but it's a chance for us to, to have a look around to see what's going on, to see if the security levels are okay, to see what the crowd's like. Um, but obviously, yeah, it's very difficult for staff that are working during a shift like that to have any time to speak to us, which is why during the day times when we can actually you know, schedule time to sit down with them when it's not so busy, that's sort of like where we can progress things more and talk about things more of UCCTV better. But yeah, the evening things, it's, uh, it's more of a, a check-in and obviously if they can we're happy to discuss things but it, it's not an ideal time for them to be talking to us uh, thank you anybody else no right let's start uh, let's start with uh, your section 154 uh, these test purchases uh, you said for you do four a year is that four premises a year or for four days 
Now we have four dates, uh, uh, Chair. We again we're split between the three boroughs, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Sorry, just to interrupt. If you could just base on Hillingdon. So I, what I need to know is how many sort of days a year do you do Hillingdon? So Hillingdon, we will do two sessions um, a year. Uh, this has to be done um, in conjunction with uh, the uh, cadet leader um, who can only provide cadets during school holiday periods. So the events have to be predominantly during the school holiday periods. It can't interfere with uh, school work uh, or effectively the, their social lives or home lives. <coughs> um, so average per visit we do probably 10 is probably the maximum we can do on any one uh, tour of duty and as a percentage just from the previous or the last uh, operation we did out of those 10 premises we uh, our disposal decision regarding prosecution was fixed penalty notices for three off licenses I remember a few years ago you actually visited every single premises in Hillingdon uh, and that proved it t two positives out of that. One, it shows that how seriously we take it in Hillingdon and secondly, it showed traders that we want responsible traders in Hillingdon. So doing 20 visits out of 1,000 in a year, that, that's a pretty low percentage. Uh, in terms of your team sizes, how, how, what was your team size before? Uh, to now, just specifically Hillingdon. Uh, Hillingdon, we had uh, three, uh, we had, well, four. We had a sergeant who was dedicated to Hillingdon. Uh, we had two police constables, and we had a civilian member of staff. Um, now we have a police sergeant who covers the three boroughs, but he is not specifically a licensing sergeant. Um, he comes under the um, title of um, partnership and prevention, which covers antisocial behaviour, um, also drug referral. So he's, he's got a, a vast umbrella, uh, unfortunately. And we are now down to myself um, and uh, Penny. Um, uh, Penny won't mind me saying, but Penny's a part-time uh, police officer. So James uh, is earmarked for Ealing, um, however, James has been helping us because of our workload, um, and and hopefully, uh, when we get two further officers, we'll be able to retain James as a Hillingdon uh, licensing officer. On that as well, want to use that speaker over there, James? Very yeah. Yeah, So on that as well, um, talking about going to those visits and actually going to the venues, that's something that I'm very interested in. Um, where there is a lot of admin, a lot of background work being done. Um, I'm working particularly with uh, Ealing Council, but we'll be going across doing bits in Ealingdon, um, which is just doing those visits and making sure, that, as you say, those premises are checked and make sure that they're upholding the licensing objectives. Thank you. The reason why I ask that question, obviously, uh, um, you guys have been obviously leading uh, crime and disorder. Uh, we haven't seen as much as we've seen before. Now, is it a case that the emphasis is taken away or it's just that manpower? You haven't got the manpower. I think it's, 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 it's difficult, uh, Chair. We, we get abstracted quite a lot. Um, I, we, we, we can't sort of beat around the bush. We do get abstracted for uh, what we class as central London duties. So marches, um, for example, just stop oil absolutely obliterated the resources of the Metropolitan Police last year um, and ourselves ended up on some occasions doing two weeks in a row dealing with this, this sort of um, aid requirement and also uh, the team strength so your core response policing your 999 calls we do a lot of that we do a lot of uh, staffing those teams up um, not necessarily Hillingdon uh, it can be Felton or it can be Ealing uh, Hounslow Borough or Ealing Borough so yes we do get abstracted uh, there's no easy way of, of, of saying it um, quite a lot uh, things have slightly improved in the last couple of months um, but unfortunately uh, with the King's coronation just stop oil protesters and numerous other protests that have already started um, we will most certainly be abstracted from our 
daily role uh, and it's unfortunately something that we just cannot avoid. Okay, um, I'm going to change to another area. Um, it, you mentioned uh, obviously all the work that you do and it's not all about uh, prevention of harm. Uh, what was it? Reduction of harm was something I read about the other day. Uh, information from the regulatory authorities from Hillingdon, how do you find that? And I'll be asking the same question from them. Um, do you get much feedback from them in terms of applications, new premises, variations, and everything else? Because obviously the weighting that we put is equal now, but it does make a, a, a big impact on applications. Yeah, I think we have a very good working relationship with our partners in the council. Um, obviously, all of the applications go to the council first and they come through to us. Um, so we've, all, we've always got that sort of like emails coming back and forth with the, the relevant information. Um, but we will meet with them um, to discuss any applications. We will go on visits together to attend premises to discuss things. Um, I, I was running with um, Daniel last week at a meeting at a premises. We were discussing something. Later that afternoon, I was speaking to, to Lois on the phone. Um, absolutely, we, we do engage with each, with each other a lot. Um, and we also attend a lot of the same meetings, such as pub watches and things like that. Um, that's good, because um, I'm looking at trouble premises uh, and the issues that are associated with it. If you're saying your numbers are, are down, uh, especially with underage drinkers, even street drinkers. Um, and the obvious one where adults buy alcohol for children uh, or small off licenses, not tainting them, but I'm just saying the small off licenses. How do you see it for the future in terms of, I understand the limitations you said with your resource and everything else, but if there's a Pacific, uh, say Daniel brings up, that you know he's concerned about Road X uh, with 15 off licenses on it. Uh, how would you then sort of get the necessary resources to actually target that? Because at the moment it seems like hit and miss. If you're there, you're not there. You're in central London, I get reality. But at the end of the day, this is a big issue here. Yeah, and as Hillingdon, uh, we, we, we need something sorted and a plan. Comments on that, please. I think it's fair to say, and we don't try and disguise the fact that um, you know we do have a high workload, and um, we don't have as many officers as we as we used to have. As David said, he's he's currently been the only full-time officer dealing with healing healing and licensing, uh, and myself's part-time. You know, and we we do work well together and we complement each other. But staffing is an issue. So yes, we will work with the council, and we will do things together. We will do things independently, and we will share results of anything any of our findings. We also have to work with a or their safer neighbourhood teams. Obviously, they're on they're on the ground. They're patrolling their beat. They know they get to know those sort of areas better than we do, and so we can engage with them as well. We ask them to help with uh, with visits or feeding things to us and and doing things jointly. As Dave's mentioned as well, obviously we link in with the cadets. They help help us as well because they've got teams there. Obviously not frequently, but again that, that's resources there. We've got the town centre team at Uxbridge. Um, they do work for us and with us, um, and again, it's all about that, that sharing of information. Um, and we have to prioritise, obviously, certain things. If we're getting um, serious crime and disorder, that is going to have to take a priority and can be quite time-consuming over, obviously, some of the other persistent problems or maybe not persistent problems, but other things that we need to address. So it is very much a balance, and it is, it is very difficult to do. Um, and all I can say is we do our best to engage with a lot of different partners um, to try and achieve the best results that we can. I, I link in, Chair, I link in uh, a lot with the Safe Neighbourhood teams. And what I've done in the past is we've given basic training on what to look for, how to do a licensing inspection, and what to look for inside and outside of premises, uh, crime mapping, feed that back to us, which they do, um, and if there is a specific problem that needs urgent attention, then we link in with them. Uh, we will deal with the problem mainly around crime and disorder, link in with uh, the ASBET, te ASBET team as well, um, and try and organise a multi-agency approach. Uh, um, probably within a week, two weeks, we, we, we have done, and we have got a specific problem in a specific area. 
uh, at the moment, which we have already organised a multi-agency approach to, um, collecting crime statistics. We've uh, managed to um, uh, collate all those statistics. We've seen a trend. We know the problem. We know who's causing the problem. We'll link in with the antisocial behaviour team and also our, um, uh, our own police colleagues who deal with uh, criminal behaviour orders. And it's a long, drawn-out process, but we, we do a lot of work behind the scenes that people don't necessarily understand uh, or know that we actually do. And I'd also say as well, that's one of the reasons why we're so keen to get applications right from the start. And when the, the staffing changes, we want the right people on the licences to take responsibility and to be running the places responsibly because at the end of the day we can't be everywhere at once and we can't see everything that's going on and it's, it's, it's a lot for, for us to deal with. So it's very important that we engage with these premises and, and the staff that are there to make sure that they're doing all they can to, to get things right and if we think, see things that aren't working well with them to sort of say, you know, maybe you need to look at this, something you can change uh, and try and work together for them to improve it rather than us intervening too much. So if you're a magic wand, what could you ask for us? Or how could we assist? Because, listen, I, 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 I would like to be very selfish. I would like, you know, I know I've known PC Dave Butler for a few years, over a decade. You know, he knows Hillenden back to front. And sharing him with Elin and Hanslow, not a happy chappy. But, listen, uh, I'm sure he'll, he'll pick up a few tips. But if you had a, if you had a magic wand, what, what would you ask for from us? Controversial, In 30 seconds. controversial chair, but a car would be nice, seeing as we've had ours taken away from us, and we're not going to get another one. So transport to, co to cover the second, the second largest borough in London would be fantastic. If, uh, if anyone has any ideas, much appreciated. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Listen, uh, we know how busy you are. Uh, and any other questions on what's been presented? Councillor Davies. Um, what's happening about the recruitment? So, if you if you're really struggling, why, what do, is there anything we can do to assist with a recru recruitment for yourself? Because I I personally am quite worried that after this meeting, licensed premises now know that they're not going to have a visit during term time, only during six weeks holiday or Easter holidays, and only if the children don't have too busy social lives. And I, I'm just really concerned. Look, we, if there's something we can do, then tell us because we can shout, we can scream. We might not get any answers, but we can we can certainly give a good effort. And as you know, this is a massive thing for me. So um, it's a difficult one, uh, Councillor. We, not for the want of sounding repetitive, but we are stretched to the limit. Um, we have. Uh, raised the issue and um, West Area BCU have actively recruited three, that's two and a third hopefully licensing officer yes to be shared among the three boroughs, uh, we can't argue that point unfortunately, unfortunately that's just the way it is um, but long term I think there's a massive restructure um, uh, will be a restructuring of the Metron Police Service in line with recent events, uh, and hopefully they will. Uh, em the emphasis will be put on what is a priority within the MPS, um, and licensing most certainly is. It's, it attributes to a high percentage of crime and disorder, um, and it can't be ignored. It needs representation, uh, both locally and from the MPS. Um, and you know, we we do work um, outside our, our our regular hours. We do a lot of stuff in our own time. We will always answer the phone in our own time um, uh, because personally I, I'm dedicated to the role I'm in. I know Penny is and I know James is already. <clears throat> so we will always be there and we will always happily answer that phone and we will always do our best to give 100% uh, but with abstractions and just the way things are. Um, it's something that it's hard to commit to something long term but most certainly if you um, uh, here have any concerns and it's something we can do and work together in advance with plenty of notice, I most certainly will go to my senior officers and say, can we ring fence these dates to work with a multi-agency approach? Um, and that will be there in stone, and fingers crossed, uh, we'll be able to work more with our partners. Um, but hopefully in the next few months, we will be looking at a big change structurally, 
Um, but most certainly, councillor, um, we'll have a think. If there's anything we can do or any assistance we require from yourselves, most certainly we'll, we'll, we'll ask. And thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that it wasn't. I wasn't having a go at you guys. Um, I know this trade better than most in this room, um, and I really appreciate what you do. But if we if we can fill these gaps, then that is the best for the Hillenden residents, especially for the licensing trade, and that's what we need to look at. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Far be it for me to get political, but you do need to have a lot more recruitment. Um, can I suggest that the opposition to us speak to your MPs? Maybe they'd like to do something about it. Okay. I mean, at the moment, I've, you, you know that I've been on licensing committee for a very long time. It used to be proactive. Now it's reactive. You're just firefighting. And with some of the license premises we've got, um, irrespective of how often you can get there, they're doing two fingers up at you and doing two fingers up at us. And as residents, we are really, really worried about it because we see things on a daily basis and we hear things. And it's all, all well and good saying you report it, but how often? I mean, you say that you can only go out very few because that, that, you know, very few times because you're you're overstretched. I mean, I think it's appalling that they pull you out to go and do stuff at London. But I've also heard uh, from somebody quite high up that the uh, funding from this borough for some of the police. Uh, police officers have been cut. So I, I'm just, I, I worry about your being pushed, well, far too far. I mean, you must have a breaking point, Dave. And that's my lot. I think we're in agreement on that. Uh, okay. Councillor, we'll start with Amitable Honour, then followed by Councillor Smallwood. Thank you, Jim. Um, uh, we all admire your remarkable work. And uh, the big worry is, as um, Councillor Gardner's first question, in addition to that, there are quite a good number of very established organizations, spe specifically in the south of the borough. If there is a community engagement, or if you rely upon a voluntary se sector, then uh, we are happy to help. And we can, I'm, I'm happy to plug in with the big community organization. <coughs> they have resources. They have manpower. Of course, it will then be uh, how you train them, how you, uh, how much you can uh, rely upon. So, yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you very much. Just to pick up on Councillor Gardner's point, I'm happy to talk to members of Parliament. Councillor Gardner could talk to the Mayor of London, who's obviously responsible uh, for policing um, in, this, uh, in London. Um, and, I, and, and he is, of course, obviously the Police and Crime Commissioner, but we also have a new uh, Met Chief Commissioner, and Sir Mark. Is there anything specifically in the turnaround plan that talks about licensing? Is there, I mean, I, I've, I've read it, but I've not read it. It's quite a big document. Um, there's quite a lot of detail. There's a hell of a lot of appendices, and he's taking it very seriously. Is there anything particularly to do with licensing um, or, or, or visits or the way that we police licensing in London that's in the turnaround plan that gives you any sort of like indication about where we're heading? Yeah, I, th I think part of that plan, it's, it's a very heavy document, um, and we've only been able to pick the bones out of it um, in recent weeks. Um, but the commission, one of the commissioner's uh, firm strategies as part of this uh, plan is community policing and as a licensing department we come under um, community policing so we come under a safer neighborhood strand therefore and, and rightly so what what we do as uh, licensing officers is community based these are community venues uh, that are the hubs of our community so most certainly yes um, because we come under what we call um, uh, partnership uh, prevention. Uh, um, we do come under that strand uh, as licensing and yes the Commissioner is looking at that and I think it's one of the, the priorities at this time um, for reasons I've just explained. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much indeed uh, James, good luck. Um, and I believe Dave, keep up the hard work that you're doing. Um, as you can see from the questions that we've had, uh, we're not shy. Um, but I'm keen on that. You 
advertise that Brunel Uni event on 17th of May. I think that, that seems to renovate with everybody. So if you could do that. Thank you very much. You can stay for the rest of the meeting or you can go off and do your bits and pieces now. It's up to you. Um, no, we're happy to stay if you'll, if you'll allow us to stay. Uh, but thank you very much, Chair, uh, Councillors. Thank you. Okay. Right, okay. Uh, the next thing on the item is um, an update on the LGA licensing for myself. I'm going to hold that off. Uh, I'm going to go straight on to seven um, and come back because there's some points that actually dovetail uh, within that. So the licensing, um, have we got any comments on that? Uh, or we all, we're happy with all of that? No questions at all, yeah? Okay then. Um, I have a question on that. I'll be firing at Daniel or Lewis. Um, page five. Um, when we talk about persons operating an alcohol delivery service, may consider contacting their license authority. That sounds awfully optional to me. And the question would be, why would anybody want to do it? Well, we've had during the coronavirus pandemic, I believe we had a handful of those who were looking at selling alcohol, uh, side businesses, side hustles, entrepreneurs um, from their sheds. And so they may contact, like any other con application, they may contact the licensing authority to get some advice, and we're happy to share, not model conditions, but the type of conditions that would tailor in that, into that type of premises. And so it's all very sort of like niche, and there's going to be um, specific nuances to every application, but we're more than happy to provide advice. And when they put in the formal application, uh, you already know that through checks and balances, the responsible authority, and that usually in practice means... Uh, our principal Lois or myself looking at the application to suggest or advise on those type of conditions for those particular premises. We move on to page six um, on the closure notice. Uh, the question is, what happened before? Is there any major changes for the police? No, no major changes. Okay. Uh, we then move on to well, the full variation process. I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, proposed conditions. Uh, I think in Hillingdon we're quite. I think we're leaders in this because if you look at any application that comes to us, uh, uh, the conditions that we have virtually like default are pretty comprehensive. They look like a lot. Uh, if you look at our CT, CCTV ones, uh, they're succinct and they're to the point. So I think that's, uh, we don't have to worry too much about that one. Uh, one, was, well, one other thing was about dumping bottles on waste. I think not many councils actually have this in place where we have a sort of 8 o'clock, after 8 o'clock until 10 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock in the morning. Because speaking at the conference, uh, people were quite surprised that we have it. Uh, Peter. Thank you, Chair. I just wonder if I could ask a question uh, regarding to the protective in Martin's Law, which obviously was being introduced following the um, terrorist I'm gonna, attack. I'm going to get to that. Is that right? Oh, okay. get to that. Sorry. Right. Martin's Law. Peter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you, Chair. Um, you read my mind. Um, I just wondered, um, Martin's Law was obviously introduced after the horrific terrorist, terrorist attacks um, at um, uh, in the Manchester Arena at the Ariana Grande concert and I just wondered how many venues uh, not maybe exact but an estimate of how many venues we have over 100 people in the borough um, that are licensed and how many of the and, and how we are currently working with those to make sure that they have um, this in place um, if it is done correctly it will reduce the, the threat of terrorism obviously in the borough and across London um, it's incredibly important and, and what work we're doing to, to preempt pre the work that needs to be done um, in relation to that specific number, I have to get back to, and it's probably helpful to get the 800 plus ones on the on the seconds here as well. But off the top of my head, I couldn't couldn't give that. I'm happy to provide that back. Um, I can say, and it goes at a much much more higher level than me as a licensing manager. But I know there's talks and discussions from director level about this particular duty. So I don't wish to say anything specific that is, is contrary to that. But I know that there's a working group getting put together to work with. Uh, the trade and so 
Is it right to come back? Yep. Thank you. Far away. Would it be uh, chair, through you? Would it be possible to have that what well, that the work of that working group reporting back to this committee, so that we can in, in relation to in relation to the licensing parts that we have, because obviously this is this is quite important. There's obviously going to be a legislative point, even if we're just noting it, given how serious it is. Uh, thank you. Um, it will depend on whether they sell alcohol, where it comes under the <coughs> licensing. Uh, Premier, but uh, I think Sh Chantel could help out on that. Or uh, we, ha I have had conversations with Daniel on this, uh, to rest assured, because this was one of the parts in the conference that we discussed. Um, and the hundred people, I think that was the question I asked, and we haven't got many. Uh, it, it obviously, it is uh, pointed out to me sports stadiums that we have, but it is as Peter Councillor Small, sorry, has raised. Uh, it is an extremely important because, God forbid, it ever happens, and it never happens there. But if it was to happen, uh, we want to make sure we dot the i's and tick the t's. Shanta, I think just on that point, it, um, it may well fall within the remit in terms of public safety, um, and so on that aspect of things, potentially. Uh, Chair, if I may, uh, Chris Morgan is our counter-terrorism representative for West Area. Um, and he delivers this specific training to licensed premises. He is available um, at notice uh, to deliver such training and updates on this. So we can link in, uh, organise this. Um, he's done it in the past but hasn't had much of a take up from premises, but I think if we force the issue uh, professionally uh, and politely, um, I think we can work together on this. I know from our side, I think it's Fiona Gibbs leading on, on our side, mm. but uh, just to reiterate, it's a, it's a massive, massive area. It's not just the licensing trade and the obligations from the trade, but it's also council's duties um, as well. I mean, the property that they own, the green spaces we own. So there is a, it's a, a massive, massive area, but there is discussions much more higher above about how we're going to implement um, and comply with our duty. Have a discussion with Mark. I'm sure we will we, we'll, we'll figure something out on that. Uh, uh, His Majesty's King, King's coronation. That fantastic come That's all. That's all in hand. I imagine. Yep. Okay. Uh, coordination between the licensing and planning systems. Um, that's why I held off. This was a, a big part of the conference where we did have. Uh, a study at the House of Lords, somebody in the House of Lords, I can't remember her name, unfortunately, sorry about that, where she, it was proposed that planning takes over licensing because planning, there were planning experts. That was pretty shot down pretty quickly, I understand. There is a distinct difference between planning and licensing, and it's going to stay that way. Um, one thing that did come out of it was something called deed of easement, uh, which I will, deed of easement? Chantal? I may have to come back to you on, on deed of easements. I've got regulatory easements, which I, I'm not sure whether that's what you're referring to, um, in respect of... It was more of a case of when we had that, uh, a block of flats built next to a very famous nightclub in Manchester, and it was nearly closed because a resident complained that it was too much noise. And this was something on the lines of... Uh, if you buy a flat next to a nightclub, you're going to expect uh, some noise. Uh, but we can come back to that. That's not a problem. I think you may possibly uh, be referring to the agent of change principle, whereby um, if you essentially buy a place and or next to a licensed premises, um, you're expected to essentially um, uh, place, place responsibility on the person's that are essentially going into an area to mitigate the issues on that particular license. So, for example, a housing development. I'm not sure whether that's what you're referring to. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, the other two points: gambling act. Um, any comments on that? Ah, oh, Councillor Chamdell. Thank you, Chair. Um, with the gambling act, you've got obviously the gambling premises, and you've got online gam gambling. Do they share data between the two, between online gambling and the premises, um, say for people that are addicted to gambling? 
Yes, yeah, I mean, we're talking about the particular premises. Yes, they will keep that information, but that's usually stored by the Gambling Commission. Sorry, can I ask? So do they share data? Say, for example, I have a problem with gambling. Um, but online, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to do. <laughs> it's a lot easier to do online, isn't it? Because I can set my own limits. I can choose not to set a limit, and I can carry on gambling. Um, when you walk into a premises, they'll probably identify you a lot quicker. So, how do they share that data? Um, say, for example, one gambling company is online, and they've got premises as well. Do they share? Can they link that data and share it somehow? I'm sure they. I'm sure they would. I'm not, it's not my specific area of expertise, but I'm sure that they would to stop that self-exclusion, those checks and balances. But then again, we've had a, a massive case, uh, I think, uh, uh, a week ago with uh, w William Hill. But I can certainly check the, the ins and outs specifically on, on, the, on the terms and conditions or what they have to keep, and I can come back to you, Councillor Chandler, if that's okay. Because that is um, the case that they've... Uh, uh, logged. Uh, it's extremely case, uh, serious because the company was fined £5.85 million pounds, uh, for not following process and this is somebody losing 43000 in four months using four different cards. Uh, somebody using 40000 in one month uh, with only two messages being sent by the company uh, contrary to the Gambling Commission's uh, rules and regulations and another one who lost 39000 uh, and the only question they asked was, you know, how are you going to pay for it? And he said, well, I've got a house worth £233,000 or something like that. Something like that. The rule, I think the question is important because if you are self-excluding online, I think that's what Councillor Chamber was asking, how does that equate to self-excluding in the bookmakers? Because you can quite as easily go and thank god those machines have sort of come down in what value you can put in um is there a connection there i think i think that'd be good to know because as pc dave butler said you know uh, crime and disorder and all the other issues that come on from gambling are quite huge ah respect to a sex establishment Licenses. How many sex establishments do we have, Daniel? Because uh, we have a one chairman. Uh, because what they're saying is uh, something on the sort of like cumulative effect. Because we don't have no policies on nightlife in Hillington, do we? No, we don't have the right. cumulative in, in, in the light or, that, or, or the sex establishment. No, we don't. Have. Okay, that's great. Right. Um, I can now move on to at the licensing conference. Uh, one was, as I said, uh, about planning and uh, licensing come together. That was uh, a good conversation on that. That took quite a bit. Um, the other point that came out was taxis. Uh, that we're going to be licensing taxis activity soon. Is that correct? In London, it's TfL, um, and so uh, I've never done taxi licensing, and I, d I don't believe that uh, we'll be taking that on. Okay, I'm that was up more up north than I think. Yeah, it's, it's outside London. Uh, the other part was obviously on gambling. Uh, that's why I take that point uh, very, very seriously. Uh, on a previous uh, conference where we were told about a young lad who unfortunately took his own life over a relatively small, what we consider a small debt, and the, and the gentleman who was actually giving the briefing uh, uh, afterwards uh, over a cup of coffee, I was saying, look, he presented it very well. It happened to be his son. Uh, so I, I think on that point, I think we really need to tie down uh, any issues that we have there. Right, we've gone on to now um, the forward planner. <coughs> Mark. Yeah, Chairman. Um, <coughs> the only thing I've thoughts given the talk today and we did have someone from this organisation attend I'm guessing four, five, six years ago it was a representative from the Gambling Commission maybe that might be suitable to come to the July meeting as a presentation if uh, Daniel can arrange that Yeah Mark I'll certainly um, ask them 
Councillor Davies. Are we able to schedule some Martin's Law training on the forward plan? So I know the police do it. If we're, we're talking about it, but not many of us seem to have a, a good insight into it. So it might be worth if we could add, and maybe some Ask Angela at the same time. Yeah, Chairman, um, <clears throat> Fiona Gibbs, I'm sure, will be able to um, do that. And also, uh, it could be something for maybe Member Development Day later in the year. And she does attend the Select Committee annually as well, so there will be an opportunity there. So, yeah, I'll look at that for you. Councillor Smallwood. Thank you, Chair. I wondered if we could um, at some point have a look at a review on how we apply and give out pavement licences. I've got an experience in my ward where we've given a three metre paving, pa pavement licence. Now, if that was taken advantage of, people would be sitting in the road. Um, but somehow that, that, that slipped through. Now, it's been moved back um, to 1.5, but there doesn't seem to be any consistency. It seems to be completely erratic and all over the place um, on how we do it. So I wondered if we could have a look at how we apply them. It, it seems small, and most people would probably not sit in the road because they get run over, but it's still worth having some consistency when we're applying them. Um, rather than more council having to pick it up when they get to see it as a review. It's, it's the distance. Uh, it's not so much the pitch. It's how much distance is left. I think it's four and a half metres. Yeah, right. um, I'm happy to, to speak to Councillor Smallwood after this and talk about this specific um, case. It, it's, more than, it's more than one case, if I'm being honest. I'm just using that as the extreme. Yeah. But whether we could have a look at how we're applying it at this, as a council. Ha happy to. Happy to. Because if, if you ever came to looking at the payment license and revo not revoking it, possible revocation, it will come back to committee. Right, we move on to uh, agenda item nine. We okay with this? We only had one subcommittee. Are we okay with that? Okay, we'll move on to AOB then. Hello. We, there's no part two. There's no part two, so it's fine. Um, I'm going to kick off, or if that's okay, with everybody. Uh, and this is to Chantel. Uh, a few things on legality. Uh, these gas canisters have been made illegal. Uh, any info regards what impact that has on licensing? moment I believe that the uh, standpoint is that there are specific legislation that covers it not within the remit of the licensing act so in terms of these nitrous oxide canisters um, I think it's the psychoactic, psychoactive um, legislation 2016 that covers these so um, whilst it does have somewhat of an impact in terms of nuisance and antisocial behaviour, uh, the standpoint from the government is that there is sufficient legislation that covers this to, to criminalise those that essentially abuse uh, nitrous oxide um, uh, canisters and things like that. So that's the position. But I appreciate that it does have some impact potentially on, on the licensing act, but the, the government say at the moment there is sufficient legislation with the 2016 Act. Okay. Um, next one is somebody asked me a question about licensed premises. So I remember when I used to have an off license, you couldn't open another one within sort of three, four hundred yards. Uh, now there seems to be spotting up anywhere. Does the law uh, have anything in there that suggests that there's a limitation to how many you can have? Unless we or the uh, you're considering to do a cumulative impact assessment, um, which essentially would look into whether or not a concentration of licensed premises is having an effect um, cumulatively on the licensing objectives, um, then at this point there's nothing that really um, uh, essentially prevents uh, licensing from... Uh, granting licences, uh, irrespective of what type, the nature of it, of what it is, providing, um, as you know, the, the Licensing Act is a permissible act, um, and, and each case is on its merits. You'd have to demonstrate that this potentially, uh, this premises um, can or cannot uphold the licensing objectives. So, in that sense, um, 
if you can demonstrate uh, or there is an issue concerning a, a, um, a concentration of licensing um, at premises, then we'd have to adopt a special policy, um, we'd have to go to full committee, um, and to that end, we'd have to demonstrate that a concentration of premises um, is having an imp impact on the licensing objectives. At this point, we don't have a special policy. It would have to be adopted in, in our statement of licensing. So that would have to be changed. I think that's one for Daniel to look at. Because normally this is more normally a nighttime economy, so having them at nightclubs, that was that was the gist of why it was brought in. But I think moving forward, mm -hmm. going forward, I think we need to look at what's happening in 2023 then. What was happening in 1987? Yeah, I mean, I agree with um, Chantel's advising. It. Right now, currently, it is um, each case on its merits. You talk about the cumulative impact area, um, and I've had only been here probably about three and a half years. There's never been an appetite to have it, but it's something that we looked at when we redrafted the licensing policy. And you're right, the effects of uh, having a cumulative impact area is that there's that rebuttable presumption. So anything that they applied for which went extra to their hours would be automatically refused. Unless you could show, unless the applicant could show exceptional circumstances, um, we looked at it when we were drafting the licensing policy. As I said, there was no appetite for it. That discussion hasn't come up since then. And I know, following the pandemic, some authorities across the country have actually uh, removed their cumulative impact. But it's something worth. We, we still sort of look at, um, but there's a lot of factors in play. Okay, going off what the the police were about Ars Angela, um, spiking of drinks. Uh, any guidance, uh, or Chantel, uh, on uh, what we can give uh, uh, licensed premises? If we consider it a problem. Sorry, I should put my mic on. I believe Sarah Dines, MP, um, had a consultation on this, um, specifically for spiking. And um, at the moment, um, it is going through consultation, and it won't be ready until, I think, April of this year. Um, and following up from that consultation, there's going to be a number of recommendations. So at this point, it's a bit early to say, okay. um, but, but certainly it's been raised in, in Parliament. Vapes. Uh, vapes. In terms of how are we managing that in within the borough, are, are we seeing any problem areas, or because it, it's if you tell us the guidance in terms of who they can sell it to and what age and all the rest of it, because uh, it's coming up in the news quite a bit, and every every shop that I go to seems to be selling vapes, no matter what it is, you know, the barbers, the news agents, off licenses, funeral directors. Yeah, I mean, following on from the last full committee, we had a presentation from um, King Yip from Trading Standards, and so you know they lead in that. We can say, like, I'm not part of their team, but they are routinely doing um, seizures at certain premises, and it's based on intelligence. We work quite closely with them. Um, we're still having the debate about whether we can pursue it in terms of licensing, because it's not a licensable activity, um, vaping. I'm not aware of any cases that have gone to. Um, a subcommittee hearing from from vaping, but clearly the lead is uh, trading standards, um, and we talk to them very closely, like we do with the police. Okay, my final one was. Sorry, can I just may I just, just yeah sure sure sorry uh, on that just on, uh, just on the back of what Daniel said that that there is a focus by trading standards to, um, in relation to to this. It isn't. Um, it doesn't come necessarily within the remit of the Licensing Act. However, it is a criminal offence, and I know that there are, have been some um, undercover operations where they are using um, young people, young volunteers, to go in there. And I can also report that there's been, I think, a successful one successful prosecution um, in relation to a vaping matter where um, it, he was a young volunteer that went into a shop and was able to purchase one. Um, so I'm on, on following on that, that there is certainly an appetite for trading standards to ensure that uh, premises, whether licensed or not, are operating within the remit of the law and not committing criminal offences, which, which of course it is, to sell um, a, 
a, a product which is for over 18s to young people within the borough. So certainly that's something happening with trading standards and they're on it. And that also extends to alcohol as well. So technically, if, if a licensed premises uh, were prosecuted for illegally selling vapes, that could potentially come before the committee because it's crime and it's all the same as non-paid tobacco. <coughs> I think I think potentially, Chair. Whether it would be the uh, it, dep it depends on how pra how in practice we implement that. Whether that would be the sole reason it was reviewed, that would be debatable. Whether it was a tag on with other offences and other problems, because the review procedure should really be used for problematic premises. And so it depends on the case that came from the trading standards. If they assumed it was a one-off, can we define that as a, a as a problematic premises? I mean, each case is going to be different, but it certainly enters can enter the sphere of licensing. If it's illegal, it's illegal. <laughs> well, it's once, twice, three times. I'm, I'm, I'm off a different, uh, different page. You know, uh, same as, like I said, non-paid tobacco, because you can sell that, keep on selling it, <laughs> despite losing your license. Okay. The last one is again, of saying off the police for saying with the airports. Uh, any, is there anything in legislation at the moment that we can actually, which seems another strange thing that yeah, you can go to the airport at six o'clock in the morning and. You can be drinking and be off your head before you get onto a plane or whatever, and kids can even do it, possibly, and yet we can't do nothing about it, yet we manage a certain part of the airport. Chair, if my memory serves me correctly, there was a government consultation quite some time ago now about extending licensing laws to airside. Um, and it would appear there was no appetite to do so, so it never happened, and it was left as it was. That's my understanding. Right. Unless PC Butler wants to correct me on that, but... No, that, is uh, that is correct, Chair. Uh, that's basically it. There was no appetite for it. Um, and it's uh, a bit of a free-for-all um, airside, 24-hour free-for-all. It is what it is. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Chamdell, followed by Councillor Davies. Thank you, Chair. I'll be quick on this. Um, Daniel, thank you. We, we had some licensing visits um, since the last meeting. As new to the committee, I found them really, really interesting. Um, can we have an update? Obviously, not here because some of it might be case specific, but we did find a few things that were a little bit missing awry. Could we have an update on the follow up and what actions were taken? Yeah, I'm happy to provide the correspondence that was sent, sent to them and information about the follow up on those sp specific premises. Happy to. Sorry about that. Um, can I just confirm something while the police are here? So the nitrous oxide cylinders, they're not illegal to use. It's the resale. Are you guys still enforcing the resale and supply of that, yeah? It's not an offence for the shops to sell them if it's for a legitimate purpose, but I think as sort of Chantel was saying, it's when it's being sold for it being abused, shall we say, and so we would very much be questioning the places that do stock it um, to, to be ascertaining who it is they're selling them to and for what purpose they believe, because they may well be committing offences there. Um, yeah, so my question was more about these ones that are buying on Amazon, etc., <coughs> street selling, rather than through shops, etc. I just wanted to clarify, is that, so the illegal part is the resale and supply? So correct, yeah, it's not, a, it's not an offence to be in possession of it. It is an offence to be selling it to somebody who is going to be using it to abuse. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Just, just on that point, um, it, it's the producing, supplying, importing and exporting psychoactive substance, which nitrous oxide is, for human consumption. So it's not meant for human consumption. So supplying it um, for that purpose is illegal. Thank you. That's it. Lovely. We do have a part two, actually. Uh, no, so he's going to be in private and of. Uh, thank you, everybody. Because uh, this is just for the members now. Thank you very much indeed.